Hello and welcome to Whistleblowers, where we take a look at some of the contentious umpiring decisions from each round. I'm Nat Edwards and joining me today is umpire Matt Stevick, who's officiated over 200 games of AFL. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, I thought before we take a look at some of the decisions from round 14, we'd take this opportunity to get a li to know a little bit more about yourself. Now, how did you actually get into umpiring? Uh, so I started as a 12-year-old, loved footy, uh, loved all sports and um, a friend got me involved, turned a bit of pocket money um, as a boundary umpire, as a, as a young kid. So I played footy as a kid and basketball and a few other sports, but um, took it up really just as a bit of, bit of hobby and to keep fit. So how long now have you been umpiring for? So 22, 23 years wow, that's um, a long time. since starting and, and 11 seasons with the AFL. So hopefully, uh, you know, five to 10 more years left. That's fantastic. Now, I know that the demands are very high on umpires, but it's not yet a full-time job. What else do you do outside of umpiring? I believe you were a teacher. Yeah, so I was a school teacher at Melbourne Grammar for, for seven years and taught year nine and 10 boys uh, phys ed and health and a few other subjects. So really passionate about helping young kids fulfil their potential in sport. Um, I'm not teaching at the moment, I'm yep. looking to get into the, to the property uh, domain, but um, love my time in teaching. Oh, I might have to get some tips off you after the show. <laughs> now, 14 rounds into the season, how do you think the umpires have fared so far? Yeah, look, pretty well. I think um, it's an incredibly hard uh, game to officiate and I think um, we're really pleased and happy with a lot of the things we get right and, and obviously it's a game where we're, go we're going to make some mistakes. So. You know, provided we are committed every single week as a group and as a collective uh, right across the group, um, we're endeavouring to get the best result possible and to, to minimise the mistakes we make. All right, well, let's get straight into some of the decisions from the weekend. And the first one involves Collingwood Scott Pendlebury. He's tackled here by Hawk Liam Shields and as he's brought down, appears to give off a handball. Now, the non-officiating umpire is about 60 metres away from the play here and he's actually pinged Pendlebury for a throw. Looking at that vision now, what do you think? Was that the correct decision? No, it wasn't. It's, it's a clear handball. And the philosophy over the last five to seven years with the AFL um, has been very strong around uh, irrespective of the umpire you are, if you have a clear view and you think there's a free kick that's warranted, uh, you pay it. Because at the end of the day, we want, we want to get as many decisions right. In this case, uh, it's a handball, so we would, we would like that one to, to be called play on. In the event that the umpire in control clearly saw a handball of Pendlebury, yep. um, we would have a conversation together and quickly determine that, no, I had a clear view, it was a handball, and so therefore I need to, to bounce the football. So you guys actually have the authority then to overrule a decision if you see otherwise? Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, we, we try and, as the adjacent zone umpire, um, and I think there's been many examples this year where we've, we've rightly called those for yep. high tackles or pushing the backs in contested situations when there's um, 16 to 25 players around a footy. Uh, the perspective you get from a from a range of camera angles versus the the angle we get is sometimes uh, very different. So we position ourselves on a different angle so we can assist where possible. All right. Well, the next decision we're going to take a look at is from Sunday's North Melbourne Melbourne clash, and we see kangaroo Scott Thompson grab the ball. He ducks his head and gets caught high by Dean Kent. Now Thompson gets the free kick here. A lot of discussion about this one. Right or wrong decision, Matt? Yeah. So this is a, a clear free kick. You yep. can see Thompson. Um, pick up the footy, he's stationary. So there is a, uh, a ducking motion, yep. but there's an obligation on the player, the tackler coming in, that he doesn't make high contact. Uh, if the Melbourne player is stationary okay. or near stationary, um, that's a different scenario. But clearly here you see the Melbourne player come in and tackle uh, Thompson High, so it's a correct free kick. So if uh, Kent, for example, was stationary and Thompson drove his head into the tackler, yep. uh, into the tackle, then what would happen? So that's that's a different scenario, but if, if Thompson, I think we saw a, an example on the DVD of Jordan Lewis, yep. where he clearly drives into Stanton, yep. a stationary player, and in that instance this year, if he's tackled correctly and doesn't kick it or handball it, it would be holding the ball. So. OK, beautiful. Thanks for clearing that one up for us. Now, um, the third incident we're going to look at is a fairly similar one to the Thompson one. Again, here we see Gold Coast Stephen May awarded a free kick after he was deemed to have been caught high by Geelong's Tom Hawkins. Was this one also a correct decision? Yeah, this is correct again. Clearly you can see uh, 
May pick up the footy, bending down to pick up the footy, and, and Hawkins moves in and makes high contact. So we want the player coming in to tackle, to tackle below the shoulders. So in this instance, it's, a, it's another free kick to the, to the player making the play, the ball play. So May didn't initiate contact by ducking his head there at all? No, clearly not. You, you see Thompson, no, not Thompson, uh, Hawkins, Hawkins yep. move in and uh, he's the one that instigates that contact. Right, so he just needed to be a little bit more careful then. Yeah, or, or tackle lower. All right, the final decision we're going to look at is another one from that Suns-Cats game. Here, Travis Barco is awarded a 50-metre penalty from a kick-out. You can hear the whistle blow and then a Suns player enters the protected area. Can you explain that decision for us? Yeah, look, some players um, react to our whistle. So in this scenario, and we try and play a proactive role, so we instruct the player after five or six seconds that he needs to move the ball on. Um, so we whistle him up tell him to move it on and then we call play on. At that point in time is when the player on the mark can rush in from right. five metres. In this instance, as soon as uh, the whistle was blown, the player has rushed in and encroached over the mark and therefore it's a 50 metre penalty. But um, we've seen more and more, particularly this year, players pushing the envelope with the mark. So in this scenario, we try and, as I said, play a bit of a proactive role. If we don't have to pay it, we won't. And we we instruct the player to react to the play on call right, so as opposed to, wait to the whistle. Yep. Beautiful. All right, well, that's all we have time for today. Matt, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me in. Cheers. And thank you very much for joining us on Whistleblowers this week. I'll see you again soon.